So hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Robust American Love, and thanks for hanging in there while we figured out that we were actually live. Uh, this is a new thing for us today, so we're really excited to bring you a live show from 91 South Street, Manhattan. Very, very excited to have Andrew and Bob and Steve with us. I'm going to introduce them in a second. Just a little bit first about the series. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Karen Carboner. I'm the president of the Walt Whitman Initiative, and we are a 501c3. We're a nonprofit, and we have the mission of celebrating New York's literary legacy. We're an organizing center for cultural activism and poetry related events like the one you're going to watch today. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram and please tune in to our YouTube channel to explore many more presentations in this robust American Love Speaker series. And please, if you like what you're doing, there are many ways to support us. Visit the support us link at our website to find a PayPal link and an address for checks. We are all volunteers in this organization fueled by our love of poetry, but we do need you to sustain these programs and events. We decided to offer this series and note the word speaker, this is not a lecture, to present timely public facing conversations on Whitman's life, work and legacy. And you can tell by our subject matter today that that's greatly expanded in many different and interesting ways. So we've had conversations by poets and artists and graduate students and, and famous lecturers, uh, but they're not designed to be academic talks. They're free and open events, and we welcome you to participate by chiming in in the chat. If you have questions, we'll take them at the end if we can. Um, and please do tell us if you like what we're doing. You can always write to us uh, at info at waltwhitmaninitiative.org. Um, a couple of announcements before we get to our conversation today. We're really excited to tell everybody that we have scheduled our 19th annual Song of Myself Marathon. Woo, 19! Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. So 19th annual and this year, very special. Um, we're doing it twice. We're going to do it online on June 19th and in person at Brooklyn Bridge Park on September 17th. So this is really early in the going. I'm just announcing it before there's even any news really on the website yet. So please do stay tuned for more, especially in April, we will get to uh, distributing that announcement through social media. We're also really, really excited about um, the, the fact that Rutgers University has invited us to the Public Humanities Conference on April 7th. We were actually chosen as a model public humanities organization by Rutgers. So Andrew, who's sitting right there nodding, and uh, Jesse Morandi, who many of you know, and myself will be giving a presentation down in New Brunswick on April 7th. Uh, there is a link to the presentation. And I think Andrew, we're gonna get this all up on our website. I guess I just wanted to tell folks that we're really proud of that and proud that people are noticing what we're doing. So thank you Rutgers for that. And um, we're also very excited about our Whitman Library, which is right behind the gentleman on your screen. We're gonna be talking lots more about that, but just so that you know, um, it's not yet public, but we are with the help of Bob Lewis and Steve Dima setting up the first truly free open access Whitman Research Library. So that's really what brings us here. We're so grateful to everyone, most of all, Steve and, and Bob for helping us set this up, for Susan Tain and um, Brooklyn College and uh, the Library of America. There are so many people who have been helping us build this library and we're really, really grateful. Can't wait to introduce it to the public, which will be the case later this year, but that's a little sneak peek behind um, the men that are on the screen right now. And just a word on our next presentation. On April 7th, I'm really proud to announce that we will have Paul Salveson tuning in from Bolton, England. Uh, that will be 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and I'll be joining in. I'm also in London myself. I'm in the UK. So Paul and I will be on UK time but it will be broadcast on Eastern Standard Time, two o'clock. Uh, Paul Salveson is a really familiar name for a lot of Whitmaniacs. He's kind of the, 
the, you know, the, the guy, the, the one at the center of it all, when you talk today about uh, Whitman's UK uh, support network. And Paul is the person who reinitiated the annual Whitman walk that started in 1886, while Whitman was actually still alive in Bolton. Uh, in the 1980s, Paul revived it. And this year, I'm very proud to announce that he's doing it. It's going to be May 28th, the Saturday. Uh, so for those of you headed across the pond to the UK, that is the place to be, Bolton, England, on May 28th. I will be there, definitely. Uh, and I've been talking to other people, including Chris Chilton, who's also in Bolton, also a major force with all of this uh, Bolton activity and Karin Kunrad, the director of Campania de Colombari, looks like we're gonna set up a Whitman weekend there. So May 28th and 29th, thank you, Paul, for setting us up. And Paul will talk about the uh, that as well as the whole history of Whitman's Bolton Fellowship. Um, Paul is very storied. He's got a number of books out. He's a visiting professor at the universities of Huddersfield and Bolton. Um, and he's a major force at the Bolton Socialist Club. So you will meet a really interesting and important player when it comes to spreading the word about great poetry uh, in the UK. But today, today is what matters, right? Uh, Whitman was poet of the now and we are in the now. And now is the time to present Steve Dima. And Steve, could you just give a shout out so everybody knows who is who? Design. There he is, <laughs> and Bob Lewis. Hello. In the middle, and of course, our dear board member, Andrew Rimby. And we're talking today about celebrating Whitman's interlinked food yielding lands with Fulton Stall Market. Founded by Bob Lewis and Steve Bima, Fulton Stall Market is a nonprofit public marketplace that connects farmers and producers with the lower Manhattan community. Located in the historic district where New York City's public markets began in the 1700s, Fulton Stall Market's storefront is a first step toward reviving a year round multiple vendor public market, a place to learn more about the region's food producers and the area's vibrant cultural history. So we're so excited to have them on board. It is truly, I was thinking actually, you know, Andrew, we, we do a lot of interviews in Brooklyn but we haven't really had as many in Manhattan. And I think it's it's a bit more rare to encounter a really active nonprofit organization in Manhattan. I could be wrong about that, but we're just so pleased to have you have you all here. And let me just say a few words about each, each of these wonderful, illustrious people I will be speaking with today. Steve Dima is president of the nonprofit Fulton Market Association and co-founder of the Fulton Stall Market. Uh, and just in case you haven't realized that, we are right now in the South Street Seaport Market area. So we're in downtown Manhattan um, and on the east side, lower east side, a spectacular view, the Brooklyn Bridge is right there and you have this wonderful um, brick neighborhood um, of buildings that date back to the 1700s. And this is, this is where these guys have located the Fulton Stall Market. As founder and president of Dima Productions, he has created and produced some of the largest festivals and community events in New York City, including the Seaport Music Festival, the River to River Festival, and the New York Comedy Festival. He also hosts a show, uh, which we've totally got a plug here, My Ears Are Bent, broadcast live from the Fulton Stone Market, I think just like a couple of feet from where you are right now, right, Steve, right to your right, right there. Awesome. Mondays, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at emradio.com. So don't forget that, guys. Um, we've also got Bob Lewis here, who is Fulton Market Association's public market advisor. He is a regional and environmental planner who has played a key role in developing and strengthening New York City's regional food system for over 45 years. That's awesome. Way before the craze, right, Bob? That was like way back when. Way before. Um, sorry, Steve? 
Nothing. Way before food. <laughs> After co-founding New York City's citywide green market farmers market program in 1976, he created and directed multiple statewide interagency marketing and nutrition programs for the New York State Department of Agriculture and markets that have revived hundreds of farmers markets across the state. And they support family farmers, provide urban consumers with renewed access to fresh, affordable, locally grown food, and they encourage learning, human interaction, vibrant communities, and a sense of place. Sounds like we are totally allied with you all. Uh, he's a native Brooklynite whose grandfather, oh, we have to talk about this, um, definitely, Bob, an early Squib and Sons chemist at its Brooklyn waterfront headquarters was once visited in his office by none other than Walt Whitman. So right there, living, living history, must hear that whole story. Um, but first, I've got to say a couple of words about my dear friend, Andrew Rimby, Rimby who is a, a PhD candidate and queer activist at Stony Brook University. He's researching 19th century literature from a queer transatlantic perspective. Um, I am also very proud to say I am one of his mentors and he is an absolutely standout student. Um, and of course, he's also like an incredible board member to the Whitman Initiative. So Andrew, thank you for being here. He's also masterminding this whole show. So we wouldn't even be here without him. Um, he is the 2019 inaugural recipient of the Giuliano Global Fellowship, a 2019-2020 Public Humanities Fellow and a 2019 Stony Brook, Stony Brook Graduate Fellow in the Arts, Humanities and Lettered Social Sciences. Beyond that, if you can believe he does more, he's the Executive Director of the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, a public humanities podcast that features literary and artistic interviews. That is also a must see. So folks, you guys who are watching, you have a lot to do after the show. Uh, he's the curator of the Whitman Tain Library that I mentioned before for the Walt Whitman Initiative, where he also serves as a board member. And he recently published an article called Talking Back to Whitman in 19th Century Gender Studies. So something to, to watch out for. He's also the associate editor for the Watchung Review. So thank you all three of you for, for being here. We have so much to talk about and we have 45 minutes to do it. So I'm gonna try to pack in quite a few questions. Um, I think, um, you know, just because I myself am curious and I know there are a number of people who are watching who are just curious about um, Steve, you and, and Bob and how you got to where you are. You're, you're doing so much good in Manhattan as far as the farmers, freshly freshly uh, produced groceries, getting people back to basics, making people think about history while they shop. Um, I just wonder how this all happens. So Bob, maybe you can start us off. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and you know where you're from and how you got to 91 South Street? Karen, I mean, it's a beautiful introduction. Thank you so much. And oh. Andrew and everyone to help make this possible. We're just so thrilled to be able to host the library and then this podcast event to, just to you know, kick off this uh, opportunity to connect uh, a literary force to what else is happening here, uh, which, which is a place of human excitement, frankly, uh, about um, the connection between urban and rural, about our dependence on the land about the people who are involved in helping to prepare and grow our, our food. Uh, things that we need to think about every day and not just take for granted. And, uh, you know, when we, we began to start this urban-rural link back in the 70s, that is myself and another planner, Barry Benepe, who's 93 now. I mean, we all get older. I'm glad to hear Barry is healthy and living in the village and still, uh, you know, a person uh, who cares about, you know, humanistic uh, city design and space. Well, Barry and I met um, after I finished my graduate work in uh, environmental planning. And uh, before that, I was a geologist. So I was very connected to the earth and the land 
and what was under it, frankly. But planning and environmental planning is really looking at what ways we can work with the earth and, and how we can you know, both protect it and meet our own needs and be sustainable. Before the word even was really used, we're talking about the beginning of the environmental era, the 1970s. So when the two of us met, we realized that there was something missing in New York and, and something that had been happening and here and elsewhere for years. And that was the urban rural connection through the public markets, through the outdoor and indoor mm -hmm. for that matter, uh, markets where urban and rural people connected and, and we could basically mingle and, and really support a, a regionalization if we could. Uh, even though international uh, systems are essential and, and we know we need that, that international stability that comes from trade, the regions make sense and always have made sense. And they make sense in terms of the health and freshness of food. So reviving the outdoor markets of what we did in the 70s, and that was now 45 years ago, as you said. And the fact that they have managed to continue even today, I was up at Union Square this morning. It's such a beautiful, almost spring day, and it is almost spring. Mm -hmm. To see the farmers there, to see the people there, is to see what, what, what has been going on and, and this sort of reconnection and, re and revival. Everyone who goes there knows that, that the farmers are producing their food and they know what the food is about and they ask about its seasonality and they know the hard work that's involved. They know the people who are involved. And this is so different than the world that we're in today where we look at a product rather than the person behind it. Mm -hmm. And we don't feel the, the, the human energy that, that, that Walt knew about and talked about and wrote about all the time, his own energy and everyone else's. So, you know, it, 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 the, the markets are, have the magic and, and we, we've seen it and we've seen the public's response and the farmer's response. So when Steve and I met, I, I was, I mean, I, I gave a long intro here, but I grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, fortunately, as a child, I had a chance to garden at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden as a child. It, that's a historic place for children's gardening. In fact, it was the first place in the country children would offer a place to garden. Wow, that's thing. crazy. I actually did not know, and I'm from Brooklyn, I did not know there was a part of the botanic garden that kids could produce in. So what did you grow there? Well, you know, that was the fun of a child exploring what a seed can produce and waiting enough and caring for it enough, nurturing it. And we see this happening today. We can talk about what's happening now citywide. But, you know, I could see what a carrot what, what the magic of that carrot uh, it was when I, when I planted it and then when I harvested it. So of course there was carrots and of course there were, you know, fresh beans and there were, there, you know, beans with pods and peas and things that you could all of a sudden explode in your hand and then in your mouth. So, you know, the magic of this is what's so exciting and, and that's poetic as well. I mean, it, it, and you know, it, I, I think, I have to step in here because I think a lot of our listeners who are not from New York, there's a common fallacy that New York is not a green place, right? That that New York is a, you know, just urban does, means not having green. And a lot of students, when they first learn that Whitman was a, an urban poet, they're surprised by the title Leaves of Grass, right? And the green cover and everything. But I think you all are kind of at the heart of the movement of recognizing that green space, as, as Whitman did as an environmental activist, and Andrew knows this, Whitman really helped set up New York's first park, Fort Green Park, by his daily editorials in the, in the 40s to 1840s to just get it going. So you all are very much carrying on that spirit. I like what you said, I guess, Bob, about that urban rural connection that you're trying to make. And, you know, I was wondering if you all could talk a little bit about the the products in the store downstairs from where you are right now at 91 South Street, because I know many of the products you feature are from New York. Yeah, well, there's a wheel downstairs on the wall that children can turn. And as you turn it, you see what's in season. So we're now approaching that moment where a family comes in and the child looks at this and he, gee, you can almost see those wild ramps coming up out of the ground and the cats with wild onions and wild uh, you know, the early greens that uh, start pushing up from the soil, just as we see the crocuses pushing up right now in New York. And, and, and Karen, it is true. New York has a lot of crocuses, <laughs> even though it may seem like a, a steel city. 
an Estone city. No, there's not just the great parts of Central Park and Prospect Park um, and, and, uh, and Fort Greene Park, but Green there, Park. there are best pocket parks everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there are hundreds and hundreds of community gardens and school gardens right. that people really, really appreciate. So no, in the market, there is whatever's in season and also things that are not in season because they're processed like cheese. Mm -hmm. So there are cheeses from multiple farms. Um, there, there's, uh, you know, uh, grains from, from the Northeast. That's a revival. Um, I, I also remember the, uh, the lavender from Staten Island. That kind of blew my mind. <laughs> you know, but because people just don't think about Staten Island having lavender in it, but there it's it actually is. from Governor's Island, which is oh, off even better. <laughs> and, and fortunately, Governor's Island remains a place of, of, of uh, sort of a, a, a preserve. Mm -hmm. You know, the mm -hmm. former uh, military and Coast Guard base is, is now, uh, you know, it's still its future isn't certain, but there's a lot of, you know, small scale, older buildings there and events that are exciting to go to, arts, culture, dance, yeah. and a garden and a park that is actually the center for recycling. Uh, of organics, so so Earth makes a lot more sense in Staten Island. Honestly. <laughs> well, we love Staten Island, but yeah. it doesn't have this sort of unique uh, space for for uh, uh, for for rural activities like that. So we have an um, nonprofit partner over there, Earth Matter. You can look that up. Mm -hmm. They do a fabulous job of educating people in the city about the importance of organics recycling and our, our markets CSA or Community Supported Ag program. People who are members of that bring their kitchen scraps here every Thursday, and then we recycle them back out to governors, and they grow that so, lavender that you're talking about. And then we use it again in our ice cream and our cookies. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. My gosh. Now, you, uh, I'm, I'm excited to learn that this is really a Brooklyn story, at least from your angle, Bob. And I'm wondering, Steve, because I know you have a shared history with Bob, is that how did you get started with all this? Well, uh, I'm also a native of uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Art. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my entire family was born in the Fort Greene, uh, Clinton Hill. Wow, Whitmanland! Uh, I know, uh, of Brooklyn. Uh, we, uh, my family, uh, well, we lived in Manhattan for a while, uh, my wife and I, and then we had children moved back, you know, we moved to Brooklyn. And uh, we go to Fort Greene Park, you know, that, that's our lives. You know, we live uh, five or six blocks away from Prospect Park and about a 10, 20, 15 minute walk from Fort Greene. We spend time there, uh, you know, all of our time there, uh, whether it's uh, watching my uh, young children uh, uh, sled down the hill and, and, and I, nervously. Or, um, you know, our hamster is buried in Fort Greene Park. <laughs> I didn't know that was legal, Steve. You know, um, when Whitman helped set up the, uh, the Fort Greene Park, he, he said that Brooklyn needed a lung. And just the way that you are talking about it, it, it really does sound like it's functioning yeah, yeah. as that for, for your family. Yeah, it's, it's so important. And it's funny when you say, you know, it's funny to me, but I understand it when you say that people don't, um, understand sort of New York, you know, I mean, I think of New York City as Brooklyn and all the, all of the boroughs and not just Manhattan. Of course, in Manhattan, we, we have, a, as Bob mentioned, we have a lot of green space as well. But um, it always, uh, you know, I have cousins who I'm related to who don't know, who think like, you know, it's <laughs> and they, don't, they don't understand, you know, like, why don't you get out of New York, you know, because that's a new thing. It's like, why would I ever leave? This is my home, you know, I've given my life to it. It's never been. You know, I mean, it's uh, the last place I would go. You're making me homesick, Steve. No, I say all the time. I mean, if I retiring to me would be uh, getting a place out in Coney Island and just be one of those weird guys, like, you know, walking along the board. Well, I mean, <laughs> going anywhere, you know. And awesome. You know, that's another connection to the to the ocean. But um, but I, yeah, so I, I grew up in Brooklyn. One of the things I, I haven't told in a while is that, uh, and speaking of England, when I was when I was about 19, I went to, so I grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, at a the time there wasn't a lot of education surrounding food, right? And uh, I stayed, uh, I lived in England for about almost a year uh, and uh, sort of up north. And one of, one of the many trips I took, I stayed with a farmer and his family uh, for a couple of weeks uh, in Byfield, 
uh, Northamptonshire, mm. I forget. Anyway, and I remember, I've told you this story, that um, I was 19 years old, and it was the first time that I picked an apple from a tree. Mm. And it was like blowing my mind that I can, I had to go to the A&P, right? That was the only, <laughs> that was the only place I knew to get an apple. <laughs> you know? And, uh, but it was just amazing to me, the experience of being able to like walk outside, pick an apple from the tree and just bite into it, right? It sounds ridiculous right. because we come, you now I live in New York state, but nobody had taken me up, up upstate yet, uh, uh, clearly, you know what I mean? But it also made me very angry that like, I miss, you know, why don't I, I know this. So it's something that has stayed with me and informed, I think, uh, whether consciously or subconsciously where I headed because it sounds somewhat ridiculous to say uh, that food is incredibly important. I say, to, I say to people all the time that like my children, when I, I don't know about you, when I was a kid, it was sick all the time because I wasn't eating a real apple, mm -hmm. right? So it stands <clears throat> to reason that my children are never sick ever. Like, and it's because they eat real food. I know it sounds crazy, <laughs> but when I go, I won't mention other states. I have an older sister who was recently sick and I went to see her a couple of weeks ago. I won't name the state, it's a lovely place. But when I leave New York, and this isn't about like, oh my God, New York, it's just, a, it's just interesting to me that, that, that it's so difficult when I leave here to find food to eat because now I'm used to like eating real food, whether it's food from downstairs or my wife owns a, a food shop in Brooklyn and Prospect wow. Markets. And you know, that's, that's what we do. We go to the farmer's market on the weekend. You know, I mean, you know, we still go to the, supermarket to get whatever you know paper towels or something but you know it's uh but real food has been it's been so important my dad uh i grew up just to tie this back to the neighborhood too uh and the history is my dad owned a restaurant on ann street here and on sundays uh i would come in with him uh to work and we were the only people here this was back when there was nothing people just didn't you know people worked during the week and then they went to brooklyn or Columbia, right. Staten Island, wherever it was and it was like my dad and I were the only living souls in this neighborhood. And of course, as a kid, I, lo I loved it. It was a very, very special time that I spent with him. And that's where I formed the love of Lower Manhattan and the seaport mm -hmm. and the area and the district and history, right? Because right. we would walk around and he would tell me stories and his history and, and it was just fascinating. So it's been a really meaningful thing to be able to, uh, Come back here. I, I came back here uh, after September 11th. Uh, mm -hmm. I was actually doing shows, producing concerts at the World Trade Center. Oh wow! And I moved everything over here, and uh, and and you know just fell in love uh, all over again. And uh, the history of uh, Joseph Mitchell, which is where the name of the radio show comes. It's a Joseph Mitchell book. My ears are bent, but um, don't tell them. Anyway, the uh, and, well. Uh, can I ask you, Steve, like what your favorites from downstairs, just to, because, you know, I, I love that you guys are in front of the library, but there is a really photogenic opportunity downstairs. We might have to do another show to just like get people around in there. So you're talking about real food, Steve. So what is real that for you in the shop downstairs at 91 South Street? Just take us through there, especially people who have not been there. Like what can people enjoy? Um, from that well, shop. Real food is very simple. I mean, it's it's anything that's not made with processed ingredients, or you know, um, I mean, we don't even allow our children to. So very rarely do they. I mean, I, I, I'm still angry at my sister-in-law for taking them to McDonald's one day. She had no choice. But I learned to live there. It's my <laughs> life that they would never step foot in a, you know, in a McDonald's. No, but uh, it's true. Uh, even though Andrew, I, what was that about? <laughs> I was wondering the same no, thing. No, no, I think fast food can be a nice treat like once in a while. It's okay to treat yourself. But like what Steve's saying, there's such a beautiful heartbeat to the market and to the quality of food that like I mm -hmm. love working here with the library space yeah. because downstairs they have a baker, there's a chef, like they make fresh sandwiches and peanut noodle salad. And like to me, I understand what Steve yeah. was saying yeah. about a real baker food. Who it's lives that. on the ship. Yeah, and it's comes over on that the experience. Pier. Where else does that exist? Yeah, you exactly. Know? And it's not processed with corn syrup and 
Yeah, yeah. Like I think if that's the substance of your diet, it's so, difficult well, if you it, don't know the other side. But to, yeah. to full disclosure, I I do let them eat candy from, from <laughs> much to my wife's. You know, uh, she's not happy about that at all. But I also I, I I'm also a big believer that if you if you just never let someone do something, the minute they're on their own, you know, then they go then they go nuts because they've never had it. You know, this, yeah. the, this, my daughter will be in college hoarding Coke and Twinkies in her closet. I don't want that either. But, uh, but it is about the education. It's about like, for me, you know what I mean? So. Well, that, that I think is the remarkable thing about what you guys have built, right? Because you're sitting in a space that is part of this organization and you're not selling anything in that space. This is a, a space for workshops, right? We keep talking about how maybe we'll join forces and have uh, some kind of workshops for kids or, you know, a writing workshop for adults or, you know, just some, some sort of poetry reading. And this is all part and parcel to the type of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's like a world that you all are building with this idea of the shop. So can we get the story of the Fulton Stall Markets? Like, I, I don't know how it started or, you know, you keep talking about the 70s, but how did you guys get together on this one? I'll be quick and then I'll turn it over to Bob. Oh, sure. Uh, my wife, who has a food background, uh, she had worked at City Bakery for a few years. Sort of Great a place. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it's closed, unfortunately. But, uh, but anyway, <laughs> she worked uh, as general manager for a while. And... Uh, she left there when we got married and uh, came to work with me because I was doing all these events and things. Actually, this was our office. Uh, it's the whole other story, just to coincide, you know. Anyway, mm -hmm. so um, the powers that be uh, at the time approached us and the fish market, the old Fulton fish market had left a couple of years prior. So it was around 2009 when they approached Sarah, my wife, to utilize the old fish stalls and start the Fulton Stall Market. And that's how that's how it started. It was one day a week, um, sometimes Saturdays, some seasons, sometimes Sundays. We were always trying to figure it out. And uh, so it starts really of, small, right? Like that, you know, it just really small. And uh, okay, and you're in the right place at the right time. And that is correct. And and we met Bob at that time because uh, he worked for for the state and was helping us. Uh, he'll tell you about that but uh, helped us navigate permitting and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we were, it's, we, we sort of hit it off. And, um, and then fast forward to uh, City Hall where my wife spoke at City Hall when there was a mandate uh, to have a, a, a larger bona fide farmer's public market here uh, mm -hmm. at the seaport, which is part of our mission, which we can get to later. But that's when we, we were reunited at City Hall with Bob and uh, I'll let him take it from here. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it was an auspicious moment to have the, the speaker right. of the city council um, hold a press conference at City Hall in 2013 and announce that as part of the sort of redevelopment of this neighborhood, um, and this is post a hurricane. Remember, there was a big one called Hurricane Sandy that had a major impact on the whole uh, New York City region and elsewhere, but uh, this is a low-lying section, the old waterfront of New York City that used to be ringed with hundreds of ships. Very important to try to remember uh, this whole history of transporting food mm -hmm. and uh, the city's revival and growth, whether it's the Erie Canal or the discovery of the Hudson River or the waterfront surrounding the city. This area, you know, was a historic place. And so uh, the city council knew that there was decades of work to protect this area from becoming, shall we say, part of the high rise lower Manhattan that we all know, the financial district. There was a recognition of its special role, its history, its scale. Um, and that is in fact, the scale of the city in the 19th century when uh, the, the, the three or four story uh, buildings, uh, uh, brick or brownstone, federal style, if you wanna call it that, were used as the point of, uh, of, of uh, um, tra trading and uh, of all of the products coming and going. So this area with all of its history finally was preserved as a historic district um, in the 70s. And actually before that, a group of New York citizens said, we, we need to retain um, this, uh, this, this remnant of the city's shipping history 
the South Street Seaport as a place to, to basically maintain for the public the memory of these ships, the saga of that time. The, the, and so a, a museum was created, the South Street Seaport Museum. Then the same people fought to protect the actual neighborhood from, you can say, high rise development. And it is remaining that way today for the most part. So the scale here preserves a part of New York's history like parts of Brooklyn and other parts yeah. of Brooklyn Heights and other historic districts that allows us to talk about the history or else it would be gone. Mm -hmm. You'd have to imagine it completely. What's under, you know, the World Trade Center? You have but, to but this is an ongoing fight, right, Bob? I mean, you know, the difficulties with holding the developers at bay, I mean, are very present in the seaport. And I know that you all are, you know, just very much in touch with all of that. Um, so that's why supporting the museum is also a great thing, right? Because the museum also could always use um, more support. Um, yeah, the museum is is one of the uh, the uh, destinations in the public imagination of what the seaport is, because it in fact uh, has a collection and operates the historic ships where our baker lives. <laughs> that's great. Uh, this is a, a serendipitous thing. Our market people walk in and There's contribute contribute their their ideas and sometimes uh, themselves. So we end yeah. up with employees who walked in and fallen in love with the very spirit of the place. And I do want to talk about that spirit of the place, that genius loci. You know, that that I was just reading uh, one of Rene Dubois books last night, uh, which is called A God Within, which which is the, the, the meaning of the word enthusiasm. Mm. Um, and, you know, if, 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 if I can think of anything that Whitman is, it's enthusiastic. I mean, there's a, a, and it comes from the word of God within, the meaning of it, the oh. root of it. And it also, and this book is really about the sense of place and, and the meaning and the depth of that. And, and that is part of what we're, we're doing here. It, it's it's, it, it's the, 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 the sense of the history of this place and the people who lived in it and worked in it and still remember it and uh, telling that story and involving, you know, the poetry and po great poets is, is to me a way of evoking that. But, but everyone can be a poet, right? And so the, the baker, for example, who is a brilliant baker, loves, is a rock hunter too, and, and very human <laughs> and, 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 and in, in his romance and his interest in everything uh, and in, in his memories. So really this is about humanity. What, what and, is uh, his name, Bob? Uh, Paul Dorr, D-O-R-R. Okay, we've got to shout out to Paul because he's yeah. our Walt Whitman, right? He should he should be on the show next time. <laughs> it, it would yeah. be a, it would be wonderful, and he's on our video screen downstairs talking about guess who, Sloppy Louie, and that uh, whole episode of what we're doing here and the famous right. Sloppy Louie's restaurant next door, which was the place that all the fish mongers went to, and many parents of people my age now rem <laughs> would, would remember when they went to Sloppy Louie's and the other restaurant upstairs, Sweets, and the old hotel that Joseph Mitchell wrote about in the New Yorker, all of these things are powerful. And of course, we're trying to keep those memories alive. And at yeah. the same time, at the same time, you know, connect in the real world now with lower Manhattan residents about the way it is now. You say the specialness mm -hmm. of now yeah. and the moment of now, they're hungry. They want to, <laughs> they want to shop. W what are they going to buy? Where yeah. are they going to get it? Uh, who, who is going to, you know, support them? And so we have the farmers who want to support them. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, this is why we've collected, you could say, a, uh, so many farmers' products and farmers who will stand behind those products um, in a way to provide the folks in lower Manhattan and anywhere with right. access and, and the special feeling that comes from, from connecting with them and supporting them and seeing the results of that. And the CSA, for example, may, maybe not everyone knows what that is, but it's essentially like a subscription to a weekly mm -hmm. delivery of a particular item. So the fun of being a subscriber to the vegetable share is that as spring arrives, you're gonna find items in your vegetable share that, that are exciting and tell you what's happening on the land. And you're gonna get an email from that farmer, from us saying what's in this week's share. That's also true of the fish, which is coming from Montauk speaking of Pominock. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so the fishermen, the fishermen uh, are going to, fishers, shall we say, are, are going to be giving what's us, what's on the boat that day. 
So talk right. about connecting with the now and the real. You know, this is this is part of what we're doing. So do I have favorite things downstairs? Yes, many. <laughs> it's actually yeah. Super moving to hear that description. And I, I mean, I, I actually wanted to turn to you, Andrew, because I know, talk about the rural urban connection. That's you, you know, Stony Brook University way out there. You're really kind of in Whitman's Palmanoc and enjoying that space. And I know lately making a real connection down at 91 South Street with Bob and Steve building the library, but also really getting, you know, fully more understanding what they're trying to do there. Can we hear it from your perspective, just as an outsider who came into this and, you know, yeah, what- Yeah, you and I'm also there? a geographic outsider in this assembled group because like I'm a so-called suburbanite since I grew up in Jersey and, but grew up really close to Philly. So I feel really at home in the South Street Seaport because it reminds me of Penn's Landing and Old City and it has that same, um, beautifully um, preserved heartbeat that I admire so much of Philly. So like when I came into this area, you know, what I knew of Manhattan growing up was when I went to Broadway or I'd gone to Central Park and fell in love with the rocks and a, a nice picnic lunch with my aunt who took me there. Um, never rode the subway though, because she was afraid of the subway. So we walked of course, of course. to her friend's place <laughs> on the Upper West Side from Penn Station, but that's a whole other story. Okay. But I will always, you know, sometimes those are the memories that stay with you. So I'm appreciative. But what I've loved so much, like you said, Karen, is meeting Bob, meeting Steve, meeting all of the employees here at Fulton Stall Market who have so many varied stories um, mm -hmm. and meeting the vendors. Like I've met um, a few who make baked goods or actually having these interactions. And I always say to Bob, isn't it so wonderful how you actually can form communication and you actually know the vendor and you know where it's coming from. And that's what I love about, whether it be a Long Island farmer's market, whether it be when I ran into um, the Union Square farmer's market one time, mm -hmm. I love farmer's markets, um, but this neighborhood I have to say, every place I've been to, there's just this need for dialogue. And it's something mystical about the seaport. I don't know how to place it. It's different than, even though I love, say, Chelsea or, you know, um, the Upper East or West Side, just different. There's something very um, getting back to your roots. That and I you're, you're not the first to feel this way, right? Like Walt felt it um, when he was walking from the ferry landing and going up Fulton Street. And he wrote very, a lot of prose about that walk and what he saw and the market. And, um, you know, I think he would have really appreciated what you all are saying. There's a connection, not just like with current producers, but history, right? So you're not just buying from a plastic bag in the, the supermarket. You actually know the people you're buying from and the people who are producing your food. And it's in surroundings that make you smile and glad that you're there as opposed to somewhere where you're psyched to get into your car and get out of there. So it's a magic that you all are really creating with this. And that's why we are at the Whitman Initiative. We're super honored by the partnership that Steve, you and Bob have, have allowed to happen with the library. Andrew, do you want to tell people a little bit about the beginnings of this since you are stewarding that initiative? Yeah, sure, sure. So right behind us, um, directly behind me, is the uh, Whitman Library, um, only in its beginning stages, because I'm sure Karen will tell you we have many boxes um, housed on illustrious Long Island. Um, <laughs> but, and I do, I always, I'll, like you said, I branched suburban and urban. I love both settings, because, you know, I'm used to that lifestyle. But like Whitman too, Whitman loved bringing those places together. And I will always remember talking about the library. When I first came here, Bob always has books to show me or recently he, um, you know, wanted to find more history about Whitman and Lower Manhattan. And I think what's wonderful is being the curator here of the library is I can't wait to open this to the public because those are the moments I'm going to really cherish is when someone is here, they actually know the curator, they can have conversation, they can grab a coffee downstairs, they can get a salad or a sandwich. And 
they can just read here without pressure to wear gloves or right um have we, that we were, quiet experience right. which we were also saying you know if it's okay with you guys uh steve and bob they can bring food up and look at the books we're not going to be precious about you know the condition of the books we would like people just to have a good time and to like you are doing blending experiences just you know, just bringing it back to a comfortable place. I think COVID has alienated ourselves from so many, so much of what we used to love doing in person that the idea of actually going to a library, right? Sitting down with a good sandwich and a good book. I, I'm hoping, and I, I, I truly believe along with you three that, that there is a time for that right now. Yeah. There is, yeah. yeah. And what's so wonderful is there's so many subjects that I'm, so I'm almost done cataloging what we have currently. Oh yeah, and wait till you get to the even bigger boxes. <laughs> oh yeah, I know, I know. But that's what's exciting is that there doesn't have to be a um, deadline, so to speak. With right. people, I mean, once we're off of this exciting conversation, um, I have some ideas. I do, like Karen was saying, with this warmer weather, I think we can all look towards something happening, especially in September, something will happen um, where you can see the books. Um, what I love about the online catalog is I've actually broken it into subjects. So Whitman and sexuality, Whitman and the Civil War, Whitman and race, Whitman and psychology, the biography. I mean, there's so much there, which is why I can't wait for people to email us, Karen. And actually I get to know who might be coming that day. And maybe they love the Civil War and I can point them to the books because you don't always get that. I mean, we come from the scholarly vein. I love the Morgan Library, don't get me wrong. I love these very, you know, beautifully preserved, uh, rare edition libraries. But sometimes you don't actually meet the person who's behind the cataloging. So mm -hmm. it's going to be a very different experience and I'm happy we can provide this type of reading library, which has been wonderful. I mean, I can, can love I when I get first? to come here. How about this spontaneous question? Um, if you had to think of a perfect snack from downstairs to eat while you read Walt Whitman, mm. Steve, you're on. What What is your choice? Well, I like pretzels. I <laughs> okay. Why, pretzels why the pretzels? Go ahead. Pretzels, yeah. they're, they're amazing. And of course, Beyond Corn is always, uh, you know, but uh, those, those are great snack foods. I like to snacks. In, enjoy. Yeah. Was no. I supposed to say carrots? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm listening to you guys. I, I know something about Whitman's eating habits, and it is legendary, and probably, Andrew, you know this, that he used to ride on the omnibus up and down Broadway. He liked to ride on the top. And um, he got a big pad of, pad of peanuts, oh, yeah. and he would just, all the shells and stuff would sort of, like, get all over his beard. But he'd have a good old time up there with... Uh, I guess, roasted peanuts. Beautiful. Well, I was gonna say, I have to mention the beautiful apples downstairs because you have literally four different varieties, maybe five sometimes. 10, 10. 10. okay, yeah. 10. And my favorite thing is getting a few different ones and just having a good old fashioned knife cutting party with apples and that. And I have to say the, um, uh, right now there's these beautiful cookies. I love, um, Hamantaschen, and there's these apricot hamantaschen cookies, um, especially with what's going on right now with Ukraine. And you know, hamantaschen is like very close. Well, there's a Ukrainian layer cake too, with yeah. about uh, yeah. it looks uh, actually uh -huh. like a slice of the Grand Canyon because of its yeah. height. I mean, it, it and it's wonderful. Our chef is is so uh, shall we say in the moment, and that is one reason we have a giant Ukrainian flag hanging from the balcony outside. I wish you could. Oh see my it. goodness. Um, we do, and uh, it's normally an American flag, but at the moment it yeah. isn't. Yeah. Uh, so there are many things there. There is lots of comfort food down there. There's local Amazing mac soup. and cheese yeah, uh, mac from and cheese. Cabot Cheese up in the up up in the North Country. Amazing. Wow. I mean, she, you know, this is not just your average uh, uh, cheese, cheese melt, melted cheese sandwich or. Uh, Charlie likes a cinnamon. Uh, uh, I know the bakery so, stuff is those are pretty off easy. the wall. The, the pies are delicious. The apple like, crisp. We're talking about bakery, but there's also, you know, a, a really substantial lunches. Uh, there's of course great soups. Yeah. 
yeah. they're, they're yeah. seasonal. Yes. But I will make a shout out to the amazing peanut noodle salad because- You mentioned it already. I, that uh, must be something that you I grab. Know. Well, and you know what it is? I'm pescatarian. So I love all the different vegetables in it, um, but they can make a really amazing grilled cheese. Let me oh just say yes. that the purpose of this, this place downstairs is really to showcase what can be done with local ingredients. Mm -hmm. That's right. the point. Yeah. It really is, uh, I, I should segue into a little bit about the plan for this market because as it is, it's just a storefront. Um, it's, it, you know, most people think of a farmer's market as an outdoor place with mm -hmm. multiple trucks and stands and farmers. And that's true. And that's, we all love that. And that's become a national institution, thankfully, since the 70s, the revival of this all across the country. It's a place where really, in a sense, the people, just like the town square mm -hmm. or the commons in a way. Uh, and sometimes it's at the town square, of course, and the commons. So there is a, a very special role that these markets have played. Thankfully, it's one of the best things I think we can say has happened in the last 40 plus years in America, in right. connecting people up and urban rural connections. There is one other evolutionary step that a market can take. And for those who vi visited cities where there are the old fashioned indoor public markets, like uh, uh, like London, yeah. London, Borough mm -hmm. Market, Reading, Seattle, Reading, Reading, Reading and Philly, you know, these are very important pieces yeah. of, of history. And in fact, Lower Manhattan had them back in the early 19th and, and even earlier. And mm. these were the places that people shopped. There were no right. stores, there were no restaurants. So I think is the Chelsea market, you know, places like Chelsea market on the West side, they're trying, they're aiming for something like that, right? Well, I have to say it's much more commercial than it, it than, than it, than it could have been. And that's not wrong, but then it approaches a food court and it approaches right. a shopping mall and it promotes, it, it, it sort of moves away from food as, mm -hmm. as the, the, as the force behind it. Got it. Markets like Reading, uh, Seattle Pike Place or, or, or San Francisco's, um, you know, Ferry Terminal or uh, Soulard in, in, in St. Louis or Finley in Cincinnati. I could go on uh, mm -hmm. and on. These were the places that are steeped in American history. We have book, books in our library here about the role of public markets in America and how things evolved. There's a professor at Barnard who we work closely with who has traced the early history of public markets in, in Manhattan mm -hmm. and how things basically became privatized mm -hmm. after the original focus on the public sector. We that, that's really what happened because I wondered, you know, New York should have a market like this, right? I was, I was actually in Borough Market the other day and thinking, okay, we have green markets in the city, which is great, but we don't have a, is, is that your plan guys? That is, Are you, that is the goal. Wow. The goal, Karen, and you, you were playing a big role in helping it happen. We, we, what can I say? We're working right now. Uh, we, there is a building lo locally here that's available, we think, that was once, we thought, offered for the sake city-owned and leased to privately. But uh, it would make sense to revive a public market yes. for downtown here. Oh, and my gosh. What a gift that would be to New York. And a it would truly... be focus. That's yeah. the point. Right. And the it, friendships. It, like, if I can, that's something I love about markets is community like actually getting to see even where i live on long island we have a market and it's in the town center like you're saying bob yeah. and i've become friends with these vendors like you know we develop yeah. a relationship and that's something that i can't wait to see where this goes because i always tell bob you're manifesting something very large and something so valuable to the community that's going to happen right if you dream it and you keep persevering and Bob has perseverance, like no one else well, I've the seen. Two of us, all of they us. both, they all do here. And, no, and Bob is super, yeah. I mean, it's I it's also like the market like that is just plain old good business sense, right? Because people love them. I mean, there's so much to do, and then there's music, and you know, places for kids to to do stuff, and you know, there there's so much creativity. And every time I've gone to Borough Market, and London is full of these markets, right? But Borough is like a really big one. I'm guessing that's what you all are working well, we towards. We really take what we space is available. We'll start with whatever we can get, uh, Karen, and 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 that would be a start. Well, how can people support this endeavor? Well, we're we're actually going to be setting up something on our website so people can actually, in a sense, contribute to the process. 
signing or saying it's important to them that, that this be that this happen. Uh, and the uh, website, Bob, is Fulton. Go ahead. Stallmarket.org. Um, you know, we're working and sitting down with city officials now to talk about this. Uh, we want them to realize, uh, not from a real estate point of view, but from a complete, you know, you could say uh, multifaceted, uh, integrated point of view um, from every aspect of this, whether well, it's- Karen also said it, it's yeah. uh, such a gift to New York City. I firmly believe that if people really knew what, it, that, what existed, I, I, the city can spend millions of dollars on big shiny things. It's all great, you know, it's fantastic entertainment. We see, you know, not, and, but I, I'm a firm believer that People will always come back. Oh, yeah. Always seek out what's truly authentic. And what's authentic authentic is the word. Yes. Yeah. Truly so. And, and I, real, whether it's food, music, venue. You know, I read this thing in the Times a few weeks ago that like suddenly younger kids are they're seeking out these old bars that are in old hotels. Like they're going, you know, because why? You know, not just you know, yeah, it's cool, but because it because it's real. It's not manufactured. You can't right. manufacture cool. It just, it's never, that's mm -hmm. never happened yeah. in the history of the world. Just and you know, history. honestly, the, the convenience of online shopping, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, no, I interrupted. I interrupted you, I think, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to interject that I think people are over the convenience of online shopping too. I mean, oh, yeah. it has its purpose maybe, but to actually remember and and meet people and interact with people i mean this is why you live in a city for god's sakes you know that not to be in some glass box in the sky but actually to 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 shop and i have to say that i you know the city has uh, when i left in last august it was a little bit crushing to see how covid had impacted just storefront shopping right like um, it, it just hit really hard. So something like this could really revive Manhattan in a big way. And Karen, um, you just say that it's not just cities, it's suburbs too, small towns too. You know, the proliferation and revival of markets has really been run the gamut from mm -hmm. urban and large scale cities where New York has maybe 150 markets, believe it or not now, not just one Wow! Uh, over the last 45 years, because the city has 200 neighborhoods, each one of them deserves in a sense, this sort of experience, yeah. why not? And in, in, you know, suburbia, there are concentrations of people, despite it may seem to be sprawled, but there usually are shopping areas, and those are places where, you know, people can once again re revive their sense of connectedness. Mm -hmm. And in, in towns, because people live in all kinds of small and larger villages and, and towns, we, we see this all over New York State. In fact, you know, the, there was a, a whole crisis in that towns were threatened by the loss of their own activity as, as su supermarkets and malls uh, located outside the town. So once the market started to revive in the 80s, people started living and coming back downtown again. So the right. farmers actually were the best friends of the local merchants and people worked together and saw that they weren't a threat. You know, they weren't invaders. They're actually <laughs> helping bring invaders. people back downtown. Yeah. No, this is, this is the truth. You need, you, people need to have contact with people in order to understand really the commonality that they yeah. share. And, and that's one of the things Andrew just mentioned, making friends, making yeah. friends and developing a certain mutual uh, uh, respect, listening yes, and, yes. and hearing uh, of other people's opinions. And so, listen, it's not without, uh, <laughs> mayor, democracy arose, we think, right, mm -hmm. in, in Athens at the Agora, we think, right? And, and right. What, did Socrates, what did Socrates, what was he doing there? I mean, you know, watching having a, a, ha having a, a cappuccino <laughs> and, and, and watching what's going on, uh, and, and maybe those dialogues started there. You know, maybe, uh, but there were all communities and, where and art that, and culture emanated from. That's and great. if I can, like, I know we're nearing the end of our time, <laughs> that, um, like, what I love, Karen, is working with Bob, Steve, and all of well, with you, Karen, all of the Whitman Initiative and with the photo market because it's also. Just like my last point is it's intergenerational, right? I'm a millennial mm -hmm. um, and to use social media effectively is really important to me. And I know I joked about fast food, but I think I'm more eager to not go to the corporate places 
and to make those my treat and find the independent places, right? Mm. It's so wonderful to know now that I'm here all the time, I seek out the local bookstore. I seek out, you know, I know you do. You've been talking to me about it, yes, right? Yes, yes. And this area is so like Nelly Jackson. We might as well Nelly Jackson. Yeah, we have to See, shout them yeah. out. It's um, the most successful store I've seen here in, in my entire life. Yeah. yeah. And I always no question yeah. why that is. Yeah. Because books. Yeah. And you both work so well together. And I think you know? that's what I love is that the Fulton market, it brings generations together. And it's hard for a space to do that. So yeah. that's right. my last point for this conversation. Karen, do well, you, I, I, do you think we could have Andrew show this photo? Oh, because I, it's about plates. We're in a place that's so special. I think uh, th this is what it looks like outside the window. It, and, and this is the illustration in Crossing Brooklyn Ferry in one of Andrew's old editions. Which one is this again, Andrew? So this is the double day edition um, with uh, illustrations by Lewis C. Daniel. Yeah, it's so soft and so beautiful, that illustration to Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. And I know that just to Andrew's left, if we open that door, and we'll, we'll maybe just have to have another episode, Andrew, where you actually walk around with the camera. But people who use the library and bring up the snacks from downstairs can look out uh, basically a little patio porch. Here, wait, and I can see show the door. Right, there's the door. So it's a full-fledged door that opens out to a little, I don't know how you'd describe it, uh, a Romeo and Juliet, a Juliet yeah. balcony? Is that the term for it? But, oh, room. he's going to open it up. This is a big Here, moment. Wait, we can show. All right, yay, we're moving. <laughs> Walt is in the house. But the door is open, and right outside is the pier. The, pier. Um, the East River and the Brooklyn Bridge is right up um, two blocks. Yeah. yeah, we'll just have to show folks or put up photos on the website. That's the best thing, Andrew, but it is a spectacular location. So I guess the walkaways, guys, I'm feeling so hopeful. And so, um, I, I, you know, it's making me feel like I just read Whitman talking to you all. Uh, but to, to really think about um, everybody who's listening, thinking about patronizing their local public markets, just like making things real again. Uh, if you're in the city, please go down to South Street Seaport, take a look around, patronize the museum. There's beautiful things going on here. And then turn the corner on South Street to 91 and you will meet in person the three amazing people um, that are on the screen right now, Bob Lewis and Steve Dima and maybe Andrew Rimby if he's in, um, and uh, get to talk to them a little bit about their ambitious plans for the city, which we only hope are realized. Um, you know, I know we're almost out of time, but Bob, you have that crazy story about the Whitman connection. I feel like we, we need to get that on tape. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, it is remarkable. I mean, my uh, grandfather, whom I never met because uh, he was uh, born in the 1850s, amazing. Um, from immigrant parents from Germany. Um, he uh, came, um, I guess, with from a professional family and became a, uh, a chemist, actually. Uh, and later uh, in his career operated a, a sort of a historic uh, surgical supply and pharmacy in Williamsburg, um, in the old section of East Williamsburg and Bushwick. Uh, when he, um, of course, he born, was born in Brooklyn, and uh, and as a chemist, he was fortunate enough to land a job as the chief chemist uh, for for Squibb and Company, which uh, the buildings that Squibb, uh, you know, inhabited uh, were built probably by Squibb for Squibb are still there. Uh, after Squibb left New York. Um, Although, and Pfizer did too. Pfizer is another major, major uh, pharmaceutical based in, in, in New York, originally Brooklyn of all things. Um, Squibb, Squibb's headquarters was on the Brooklyn waterfront and it was really a few blocks from uh, Whitman's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. neighborhood, uh, neighborhoods, shall mm -hmm. we say, and also uh, the Brooklyn Eagle. Um, the building still stands and there's a big plaque to Squibb in Squibb Park. 
if people are from Brooklyn, and I know some people out there are from Brooklyn, so if you're in Squib Park, that little skateboarding park that's lead, that leads to that little new bridge that crosses over into Brooklyn Bridge Park, there's a beautiful plaque about Squib and his philanthropy. I mean, this guy was a really pretty amazing person. So, yeah, and, please. And at the time, public health was on their minds. Uh, you know, we didn't have a pandemic uh, then. Uh, well, I'm sure we had plenty of other issues and illnesses uh, and no antibiotics, of course. Uh, but um, I guess what happened was that uh, my, my grandfather, again, I never met him. He died in 1941 before I was born. Um, he had a diary. He kept the diary of visitors who came into his office at Squibb right there. And uh, I wish I had it with me today, but I don't. Uh, this diary includes the phrase, Walt Whitman visited today. Wow. And, you know, it was just a note. And, uh, I mean, I don't think we think he thought of him as a celebrity. He thought of him as a personage. Mm -hmm. And a personage who came out of interest in public health. Uh, right. Because Absolutely. Squibb and others were involved citywide in researching how to deal with epidemics, right? How to deal with prevention. Um, and this was a much smaller world, right? Uh, people kind of knew each other, the hospital folks, the sanitarians, we called them. And, um, and of course, people were grinding their own medicines in those days. They were, they were manufacturing them later. But so that little Walt Whitman visited today note in his diary. I mean, what, what can you say? I mean, oh my goodness, Walt is, is totally in the house. And yeah. at first, I thought the hat was just a coincidence, Bob, but uh -huh. now. I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, no, I know we have this great portrait of him over here with a nut. I've been wearing this all winter. I, I think it's time for it to come to go. It's spring almost, but. Oh, I don't know. I think that the folks who are going to come down to 91 are, are looking for that and right, looking right, for yeah. the energy. Anyway, that, that's my little quip, my little story. I, I think, it, you know, it's just remarkable. And I'm, I'm a fortunate person to have this. Yeah, we can uh, end like, with this. Oh, oh <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's oh my gosh. Treasures no, I, so I, many treasures. Meant to be. Treasure. Absolutely meant to be. Most this partnership of the Whitman this Initiative. So wonderful. And so Fulton wonderful. Stone Market, Bob Lewis, Steve Dima, and Andrew uh, Rimby just in charge there. Thank you so much, you three. You totally made my day. I, thank I feel. You, Karen. Thank Thanks to everyone out there, too. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Please patronize your uh, local markets if there's anything we've learned today. And also just head down to 91 South Street to meet these great folks. Thank you, everybody. See you April 7th. Bye. 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 <laughs> so much fun. She's so unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. We're good.